we are entering into a, a new chapter for our course today. Uh, let me begin by just orienting you to where we are in the course. So far, we've been talking about see, these core principles of genetics, alleles of genes, position of genes, independent assortment of chromosomes, looking at these principles in humans for human Mendelian traits, mutation, the nature of mutations, how they impact uh, genes and genomes. So we're now going to apply a lot of these concepts and develop some new ones to this second section, genetic analysis, where our goal is to use the principles of genetics and genetic tools to explore the mechanistic basis of biological processes and to develop applications such as in engineering, medicine, agriculture. So that's what we're going to be focusing on through these lectures I've labeled here as genetic analysis, so this next phase of the class. And then in the final third phase of the class, we'll turn to the genetics not of individuals, but the genetics of populations and how we can utilize uh, population data for uh, uh, investigating complex traits. Okay. All right, so here's the basic idea of genetic analysis where we want to view some biological process um, as a, a process involving many component parts that together bring about that some kind of action or process, where our goal is to identify the component parts that allow the system to function, some attribute of biology. Uh, so like if this is the process of interest, just as in a, a conceptual parallel, we would want to identify the, the genes or the components of the system and to understand how they work to bring about the functioning of the system, we'd want to break those genes in particular ways. And we'll spend a lot of time talking about doing that. To see what goes wrong with the system after we break some part. Okay. To then infer something about that, how that gene normally brings about the functioning of the system. All right. So that, that's what we're going to be trying to do. Uh, there's lots of ways to study processes in biology, and genetic analysis is, is one major um, collection of uh, approaches uh, that we'll be discussing. And uh, there's lots of tools. This is going to be the part of the, of the course where we're talking about a lot of recombinant DNA tools, CRISPR, editing the genome by design, making mutants in specific cell types or times in the life of an organism, and things of that nature. So we're going to teach you how to do all of those things. OK. So let's begin um, our discussion here on this topic. with just a little bit of a conversation to help sort of frame some of the approaches we could take. Um, so this began, and a lot of sort of studies of biological processes, we need to begin by choosing some kind of problem to study. So we'll define a problem. And let me just get some suggestions from you guys to sort of give you a sense of how to think about what types of problems we'd be, we could be studying in this way, and to maybe frame some of our discussion. So if you could pick anything in biology where you'd want to understand how it would work, just something you're curious about or something where there's some application you can envision, what type of problem in biology do you find fascinating but mysterious where you'd want to know the mechanistic basis for it? And then maybe we can pick a couple of those as sort of case studies to talk about it at several points in our discussion. So I'm open for some suggestions. It could be anything. And I'll tell you if I think it's suitable for this approach and how. Yeah? Mechanisms of structural variation in genomes. A very specific topic. OK, so there are going to be some mechanisms that lead to changes in genome structure in the genomes. OK, recombination in meiosis is one. The expansion or retraction of repeats. Um, the recombination at repeats. Things like that can lead to structural variation in genomes. One could uh, try to investigate that by trying to see what genes are involved in recombination. What are the sort of the properties of recombination that lead to it happening uh, at meiosis? Um, pairing, where it's happening in the correct uh, position versus happening in the incorrect position at some other kind of repeat and so on. So you could investigate all those with genetic analysis because there's going to be genes involved in all those processes. There's going to be genes involved in pairing in meiosis. There's going to be genes involved in recombination. You could try to find those genes using genetic analysis and then study what they do. 
Okay, so some other, some other suggestions. So immunotherapy uh, was the, the topic raised, and in particular why some people, you could also ask some tumors, might respond well to uh, PD-1 uh, inhibition for uh, immunotherapy, where you can activate the immune system. The tumor cells can prevent immune cells from attacking those tumor cells if the tumor cells are producing novel antigens that the immune system can recognize. And if you block this sort of uh, uh, negative regulation of immune cells from attacking a tumor, then you can, the, the immune cells can, can kill some of the tumor cells. So this is the basis of a lot of ideas of immunotherapy. So you could, you could try to define some specific Assays. If you wanted to know the difference in individuals, okay, so let's say you have some tumors, you see some people respond well in a population, some people don't. You might hypothesize there's a genetic basis for that. Um, you could look at twin studies if there's enough data. But you could also do, um, you could look at uh, pedigrees if there was some particular thing. This could be hard with something as specific as this. But probably you would uh, want to approach that genetic difference question with uh, population genetics like methods that we'll talk about later in the class. What are the differences between individuals? If you wanted to break it down to the biology involved, you could say, well, there's T cells and that, that come into a tumor. Well, what leads to them coming into the tumor? And they have certain attributes. What leads to them having their attributes that can lead to killing of the tumor? What are the mechanisms that are involved in tumor cells producing molecules that inhibit, inhibit the immune system from attacking them? You could try to find those mechanisms and molecules in all of these cases, we need to develop some kind of assay. In our assay for genetic analysis, we want to have some reasonable specificity where we're defining a question where we have some hope of dissecting the genes that are involved in some particular step of the process, um, like how the T cells infiltrate a tumor or, you know, break down the question into sort of individual components that we could look for roles for genes in those processes. And then we could study those using genetic analysis. Okay, other suggestions? Yeah. Uh, you could look at the genes that control um, cell development and differentiation to see if you can look Okay, development and differentiation. That's a, that's a great one. Um, so you could then, I mean, so there's, there's tons of genes involved in development. Um, and so again, I would try to, uh, I would recommend breaking down the problem to get it more specific. So during development, some cells are going to have to make choices, right? So some cells are going to choose to make a cardiomyocyte. Other cells are going to choose to make a neuron. How in the world do they make those choices? And then once they make those choices, then how do they execute the program of so-called differentiation to mature into the cells that have those mature functions? So you could try to develop some assay. You could look in an animal, or you could try to do it in tissue culture. And then you could try to break genes and say, well, which genes control which aspect of those processes? Okay. Now, you might imagine, if you think about this metaphor, that everything's so interconnected that you go in and break component parts, some gene, like the, the, the whole engine would explode, right? Everything would, it would just be chaos. Everything would, would, would become dysfunctional. And could you, could this, could this really work? Can you go in and like mutate genes and then really understand what, what specific aspects of biology are controlled by those genes? And it turns out uh, biology is highly modular where there are some components of the system that you can break and the other components of the system can still function just fine. So you can find mutants, for instance, that have difficulty developing a heart but have the differentiation of cardiomyocytes, so say, but have no trouble in those same mutants to make liver or kidney or pancreas or skin or these other cells. Now, they won't survive, but you can still study that. Okay, so, and that, that kind of modularity, you see at all kinds of levels, even within the cell, you can break genes involved in, in specific aspects of things happening within the cell, and a lot of the other things happening in the, in the cell are still okay. So in that way, because of the modularity, we can go in and break things and try to identify and study the components of these individual modules. How are we going to study these problems of immune infiltration to a tumor or development to a cardiomyocyte uh, or, or whatever else we, we come up with of interest? It really could be anything. We could be interested in memory formation. We could be interested in uh, innate immune responses to viruses. Uh, anything of interest can be approached with with uh, genetic analysis. Okay, so how do we study it? So 
So moving forward with our sort of we've, our concepts in mind of we're defining some assays with some specificity, we're going to study some module. How are we going to do that? Any suggestions? We want to identify the genes and how they work to control some process. We're going to take an experimental approach here in this section of the course. What can we do? Screen all genes. OK, so there were some specific suggestions there about looking at the function of all genes in the process systematically. So there's about 20,000 genes in most uh, uh, multicellular organism species. That varies, you know, plus or minus 5 to 10,000, depending on the species. But, um, but anyway, roughly that kind of order of magnitude. Um, so we have like 20 to 30,000 genes. Fruit flies have you know, like 17,000 genes, et cetera. OK, so, so the suggestion was to use something like CRISPR and break each one systematically and then look at the process. Now, that's going to be pretty hard. Let's say we're looking at cardiomyocyte development. Let's say we're doing a mouse or something like that. We're going to have to work on something that has cardiomyocytes. So let's say we're doing a mouse. Well, you, you know, you're going to have to go in with some kind of process, and we'll talk about these processes later, maybe injecting a, a fertilized egg with your CRISPR reagents and making a mutant. There's other ways to do it. Um, and then you do that for gene one, and then you have to develop a mouse out of that. You might have to do some crosses, depending on whether that first mouse is heterozygous or homozygous for what you've manipulated, and then, uh, then look at it. Or you could have to you know, order such a strain from some repository. But then you have to do that 20 to 30,000 times. We'll talk about why that, that's a challenge. And now, nonetheless, there are sort of consortiums of uh, collections of gene disruption uh, sort of libraries of different species. There's lots of mutant strains of mouse, for instance. And one could look at all those, but that's going to be a, a, a very painstaking process. Um, but that, that is one approach, to systematically, gene by gene, test each gene. Very slow. OK. Other ideas? It's, it's a good suggestion. Yeah. That's a good one. So you can look for naturally occurring variants. Um, so if you want to look at humans, you know, that's one of your major things you can do. There's not a lot you can do with humans experimentally, of course. Uh, there's some things we, we, you can do in cell culture. But um, you could look at natural variation. And you can do that with any organism. You could look at natural variation if there's some variation in the process of interest and ask, what are the genes underlying that natural variation? You've already learned some principles of how you could do that. You'll learn some more by doing crosses, looking at polymorphisms, and asking which polymorphisms go with the whatever it is causing the trait, and so on. Other ideas? These are good suggestions. This is a good starting point. Anything else? Yeah. OK. All right. So there's, there's some good suggestions in there. So, so, one, so this, the part, first part of the suggestion is looking at expression differences. So you could say, well, let's look at what genes turn on as a cell, a progenitor cell, is turning into a cardiomyocyte. And what genes are, are specifically on there as opposed to uh, in cells turning into other things? And you might say, well, a hypothesis I could have is that some of those genes, in particular, have some unique role in carrying out this program. And then you could say, well, that's a much smaller fraction of the genome. Why don't we just make some guesses that it's some of those genes? And maybe based on their predicted molecular function, you'd have some good guesses. And then, and then you could go in and use CRISPR or whatever. We'll talk about how to do that in the future and mutate those genes specifically and test them. You also talked about uh, natural uh, variation. Like, let's say there's some human patients with defects in cardio cardiac development. Let's say you use, you use LOD scores. You know, there's some trait like that in a pedigree you see. You use the kind of LOD score kind of ideas, and you find the gene that's mutated. You could say, well, now let's like study this in the lab. And, and if we could come to understand how this gene functions, maybe we could think about uh, uh, therapeutic approaches, if possible. So then you could take that gene, find a counterpart in some other organism that you could study in a lab, and then try to manipulate that gene by design in the lab and then study it. So those are, those are some good approaches. I, I mentioned if we're studying something in humans, we, we could do it with genetic tools in cell culture. But for the most part, if we want to look in an organism, we're going to be, we need to be working with some organism we can grow and study in a lab. Okay. And there is a lot of merit for studying any process of interest in any organism for its own right. Just what is the beauty of the biology and how it comes to be in that process you're interested in? 
And undoubtedly, there's some prob probably some general principles there. But nonetheless, in many cases, you might be interested in applying the knowledge from studying it in some organism to, uh, to other organisms like ourselves. So if we have some process, let's say some that we're studying in, in species A, there may be some process, we'll call it process X, could be our cardiomyocyte differentiation or T cell infiltration of tumors. So let's say there's some, some gene, gene X that's involved in process X. And then we have uh, species B. that also has some process X. Right, so maybe there's an A version of process X and a B version of process X. They're similar, but you know, there's some species-specific differences, let's say. OK, well, these species are going to be related at some point in evolutionary history. Um, and at some point in evolutionary history, they will have had a common ancestor. So there'd be some common ancestor that then diversified that led to species A and species B. And let's say this common ancestor had process X. And let's say in this ancestor, process X was controlled by gene X. Then unless in evolutionary history, in the evolution of species B, Evolution kicked out gene X for species B, and some new gene came con to control it. Unless that happened, which is, for most processes, unlikely, there's still going to be a gene X controlling process X in species B, which can be studied. So let's say, for instance, um, this is Species B is human, let's say, for example. This species could be something we could study in a lab, species A, like some kind of model genetic system or experimental system. These genes, gene X and species A and gene X and species B, they will have some similarity. They have similarity in their sequence, okay? And the reason for that similarity in sequence is because of common ancestry. So let's say there's some, some gene uh, involved in, um, let's say, uh, copying DNA and uh, DNA polymerase in species A. If we go outside and find some species, like a, some snail or something like that, and we, and we look at the gene copying DNA there, that gene copying, that's encoding and protein copying DNA in that snail is going to be more similar to your gene copying, um, let's take it in you. The gene in you that's cop encoding DNA polymerase to, to, to copy DNA is going to be more similar to that snail's gene than it is going to be to any of your other genes. Right. Okay. So genes that are display this similarity because of common ancestry, these are uh, called homologs of one another. And this process of similarity explained by common ancestry is the definition of homology. Okay. 
So these genes in particular, you would call them orthologs. We're going to study organisms in the lab and hope to learn some general principles um, and information about how genes work in particular processes that will explain how similar genes work in other organisms, including in us. Okay. There can be other reasons to study a process in a particular organism besides similarity to some process in humans, uh, but that's just one example of a reason to study it. Okay. So what species are we going to study it in? So this is... So let's start talking about some uh, genetic model systems that we could look at. So let's say we, I'll make a little table here just to introduce the topic. Well, we'll talk about some different organisms, their generation time, and how many individuals you can keep in a cubic foot. These are some of the properties that matter for thinking about organisms you'd study with genetic analysis in the lab, but not all. Um, the fecundity, easy of culture, ease of culture, et cetera, et cetera, but this gives you some sense of things. There's a question in the back. Orthologs are, uh, are homologs. Um, you can have, in the course of evolution, Species A might have duplicated and diverged gene A, so there's many copies of, of gene, uh, oh, sorry, gene X. So there could be many different copies of gene X that have come to, to diversify a little bit. And so orthologs are the ones that share a common uh, function with their last common ancestor. So you can have orthologs and paralogs, where paralogs are the ones that have duplicated and diverged along some particular branch. So those are two types of homologs orthologs and paralogs. Okay. Now, in this part of the course, we're largely going to be talking about multicellular organisms. We've talked a lot about single cellular organisms, which are very powerful for asking questions about how cells function. Bacteria, yeast, those have been the ones we've talked about a lot. Just for reference, I'll put uh, yeast on here. With generation time of about two hours and about 10 to the 12th individuals per cubic foot. You can see how you can do a lot very quickly. <coughs> if you have a basic question about how genes control some basic functioning aspect of the cell, that's an awfully good place to look. Okay. Now let's turn to multicellular organisms. C. elegans is one example. This is one of the simplest animals around. It's got about, outside of the, the gonad that, and the, uh, the cells making the gametes, it has about 1,000 cells that make up the animal. It's got a three-day generation time. And you can keep a lot in a small space. We've been talking about Drosophila uh, throughout the class, an example genetic system where we have about a two-week Generation time. You can also keep a lot in a small space. A prominent model uh, plant species for genetic studies, Arabidopsis, about seven to eight weeks. And you keep about 48 in a cubic foot. Zebrafish, generation time about three months. About 25 in a cubic foot. Mouse, about three months. One, roughly, per cubic foot. OK. These are some of the major genetic model systems, classic examples of genetics and multicellular organisms. There are many others. And it is becoming increasingly possible to apply the tools of genetic analysis in different organisms using the ease of genome sequencing, 
variety of other types of sequencing technologies for specific experimental purposes, and the ease of gene manipulation with a, a host of tools, including CRISPR. But these are some of the most uh, prominent abundant ones. Now, if we wanted to do things in human, as I've mentioned, a lot of what we're doing is either using natural variation or studying things in cell culture. And there's ways to do things where you're manipulating genes systematically in cell culture, for example, using CRISPR, which you'll learn more about. So he, these are those organisms <coughs> I've listed on the screen. And you know, one was, wants to think about which species to look in. Um, there's the faster the generation time and the more animals you can keep or individuals you can keep in a small space. Um, the more you can do. And so you still might want to have some of these more complicated models for studying processes that can't be well modeled in, in other simpler uh, cases. For example, if you want to study cardiomyocyte development, you may want to do it in a mouse or a fish, um, you know, some vertebrate specific, you know, biology, T cells, uh, then you're going to need to, that's part of the adaptive immune system, you're going to need to go to some kind of a vertebrate for that. We've got these organisms. Um, I'm going to give you, I'll, I'll give you a little bit more information about some of these organisms for thinking about which organisms to use for studying which processes. So this is C. elegans. Uh, this is a fertilized egg. This is the, the first cell division in C. elegans. Um, so this is the, the uh, maternal pronucleus, so from the egg. This is, coming, this is the nucleus that's come in with the sperm. And there's a video here where in the first division, what's going to happen is these two nuclei are going to come together and fuse to make the zygote, and then it's going to start dividing. And you can watch this entire process. Here's the first division, the second division, and so on. And it's going to happen in almost the same exact way from individual to individual of the wild type C. elegans. And you can watch, because it's transparent, all of the processes that are happening as cells choose to make muscle cells or neurons or skin cells or whatever it is. You can see some cells dying in here as they round up. It's part of the natural program of what's happening in development. It's forming a head musculature, et cetera. And here's the time. This is nine hours. So by about 12 hours here, you have a complete animal that's formed organs and all of its tissues. So in, a, in you know, less than a day, you could, you could look at this. And then you could look for mutants and genes that are involved in any of those processes, cell differentiation, cell movement, nervous system wiring up, sending out uh, syn uh, at synapses, sending out signals, et cetera. Here's zebrafish. It's also attractive because it's transparent. You have this three-month three generation time problem, but uh, it's got a lot of experimental uh, advantages. So if you want to study a vertebrate-specific process and watch it in, in real time, you can do that in this species. So here you're watching a zebrafish develop, and the development happens quickly, a matter of days. Here you can see the head beginning to form. There's the eye. Uh, the brain is forming right here. These are all going to become neurons. Here's the musculature and skeleton forming down here. And you can label cells and watch them. These are all the nuclei dividing as a, a fish is developing. These cells are all making their decisions to be cardiomyocytes or neurons or other things. And you can look for genes involved in all these processes, the division, the movement, the differentiation, the organization into organs, and so on. Here's a little bit later in development where you can, you can see the individual blood cells, the white cells, the red cells, uh, the blood vessels. You can watch them be formed and the cells be made or the heart beginning to beat and look for mutants that are involved in any of those processes. Mouse, we'll talk a, a bit about mouse uh, as we go. Um, they're very similar to humans. Um, they don't look a lot like humans, of course, but on average, their genes are 80% identical to humans in the coding region. And the vast majority of the genes that you have in your genome, mouse has an ortholog in their genome. And even though things are a little bit slow because of generation time, there are very powerful tools for editing the genome by design for genetic analysis that we'll talk about. The nature of alleles. OK. So let me give you a thought experiment. Let's say we're studying some human disease. We've got pedigree information done log scores, we found the gene, we found the mutations in the gene, so we know what it is. Now we're working in biotechnology, and we think, let's try to develop a therapeutic based on this new knowledge. We know the protein that's mutated in individuals with the disease. Now we want to develop some molecule that interfaces with that protein to try to do something to treat the disease. 
What do we want that molecule to do? What do you think? Such a hypothetical therapeutic. What do we want that molecule to do? To the protein. Or I'll make it more general. What do we want that molecule to do to the, pro <clears throat> the process controlled by that protein? In reality, the, the, inner, the therapeutic doesn't have to act directly on that protein. We learn more about how genes interact with one another. We want to sort of do something that's going to treat this disease by affecting the, the protein itself that's mutated or some process controlled that, by that protein. But, but in general, what do we want this molecule to do if we could try to treat this disease? Yeah. OK. OK, so the proposal is you want it to bind to the protein, perhaps with some considerations about affinity. But um, when it binds to the protein, what are you thinking it's going to do to the protein? Change shape so it can't interact with others. So is that going to um, eliminate function of, the, the, of that protein? OK. So the proposal was to find a molecule that will block the function of that protein. Now, let's keep that in mind. And now think in general about the mutations we might find from a screen or in some disease, natural variants, whatever it might be. What are general ways in which mutations can affect the functioning of a protein encoded by a gene? What might a mutation do to a protein? Yeah. Can't fold. OK. So there's plenty of mutations like that, missense mutations, that disrupt folding of a protein. If the protein can't fold, what's going to happen to its function? Can't do its function. So let's call that a general class. Let's call that loss of function. Now let's go back to our disease where we designed a, a molecule that can bind this protein and inhibit it. Is that going to make the disease better? Well, the mutation is already inhibiting the protein. If you have a loss of function allele, what do you want your molecule to do? Yeah. And yeah, OK, so we could generalize that and just say improve activity of whatever is disrupted. I mean, it could be improving the, the activity of that protein, could be improving the interaction with something, could be, you know, alleviating a negative regulator of that protein, whatever it would be to somehow improve the normal function. OK, so that's loss of function. Is there any type, other type of mutation that we could have? Let's see. Yeah. OK, so the proposal is overexpression. That happens. We'll come to that. Um, so, but we could generalize that into a, another general category. It doesn't have to be overexpression. Or we've, we have gain of function. Here, if we have gain of function, was the original proposal for this molecule a good idea? Yes. OK, and there are plenty of diseases that involve gain of function. Uh, and I'll, I'll just give some indications of some in a moment, uh, where an inhibitor would be the great idea. OK, so you can see why for applications, you want to know what the nature of your allele is in order to design approaches. And you can also see why for understanding natural processes in biology, it's important to know the nature of allele to infer what the normal function of that gene is. To inhibit some process, to activate some process, you're going to try to infer that based on what's gone wrong following one of these types of mutations. Another class of mutations I won't go further into right now are mutations that create some new function, some altered function. So that, that happens as well. OK. So let's now uh, talk about how to figure out whether you have a loss of function or a gain of function allele. And what, is the, what are the details of how it's disrupting function? So first, let's talk about recessive phenotypes. And then we'll talk about dominance. Importantly, recessive phenotypes are almost always associated with loss of function. Okay. 
So if you have a recessive phenotype, almost always you're dealing with some kind of disruption, reduction, loss of function. All right, so that's a great starting point if you're looking at a disease to think about what's likely happened to the gene that's being mutated or an isolate from a screen. Now, you could have complete loss of function. where the gene has no function at all, that's called a null allele. An example would be a deletion of your gene. There's nothing there. You could also have missense mutations that affect the active site of some enzyme, frame shift mutations, nonsense codons early, and so on. You could have incomplete loss of function. And that type of mutation is called a hypomorph. That kind of allele is called a hypomorph. That's very common. Not every mutation in a gene completely destroys its function. We could go back to some of the specific suggestions, like a folding defect. Well, maybe some of the times it folds just fine, and some of the times it doesn't, based on some stochastic events. Or maybe it folds into a pretty good shape, and, but its interaction with some partner is slightly disrupted, et cetera. So there's lots of ways in which a protein can retain some function, but not be functioning at its normal wild-type levels. That would be a hypomorph. One way in which we can try to distinguish between these possibilities is to use what's called a dosage experiment. And I'll come to these terms in, in a moment for this dosage experiment. In this dosage experiment, we'll also use chromosome rearrangements. For example, we could use a deletion allele. If there's some large region of a chromosome deleted, or some size region deleted. Here's our hypothetical chromosome. Let's say some gene of interest that we're studying is right here on this chromosome, gene X. Okay, so let's say we have a different strain that we know from other work has deleted the region from B to D or B to C. So this would be a, a deletion strain that we know must have a deletion of a region containing our gene. So this could be a deletion strain. Sometimes called a deficiency strain. I'll just call this one DF1 for deficiency. Okay, and we can use this experiment in a dosage, uh, th this uh, strain in a dosage experiment. Where we'll look at the phenotypic strength of individuals of given genotypes. What, but let me pause and, and uh, explain what I mean by phenotypic strength. Uh, so I have these two terms on the board, which could reflect uh, some measure of phenotypic strength, or the sort of how bad a phenotype is in a given mutant strain. So the first uh, kind of measure of this is expressivity, which is a measurement of the intensity of the phenotype in animals of a, of a given genotype. So examples would be, let's say the, the mutant strain of interest has shorter limbs. Well, what's the, how much shorter? What is the average length? Okay, that would be the expressivity. You might have one mutant strain that has very short limbs and another mutant strain from your screen 
that has a little bit shorter limbs. Uh, the other possible measure of uh, phenotypic strength that one could use is um, penetrance, which is the percentage of animals of a given genotype that show um, this phenotype. We used a simplifying assumption when we talked about pedigrees that we had 100% penetrance of the phenotype just to make it easy. But in reality, it could be with our mutation, only some percentage of the animals that have a given genotype will show some phenotype. Okay, so that's what we're gonna use to talk about the strength of the phenotype. And let's compare the phenotypic strength of individuals of these two genotypes. Let's say, I'll show you that M1 was a hypomorph. Which of these two strains would display greater phenotypic strength? Any suggestions, predictions? So M1 is a mutation in our gene, but it's not completely eliminated function. There's still a little bit of function for M1. Is your hand up there? Yeah. You think this is going to be stronger than this one? So raise your hands if the one on the right is going to be stronger. Raise your hands if you think the one on the left is going to be stronger. Anyone want to take a shot? I, I'm going to argue the one on the left is going to be stronger. Anyone want to take a shot at explaining why they think that? Exactly. Okay, so if there's a little bit of function here, you've got a little bit of function from this allele and a little bit of function from that allele. And a little bit of function from that allele. And no function there. So if the phenotype is caused by reducing function, this has even less function than that. So the phenotype, the abnormal phenotype, is going to get worse. Okay. You have less function, worse phenotype. Okay. Whereas with the null allele, our mutation acts just like a deletion. We see the same phenotypic strength. And that's it for recessives. Okay, we can, we've got, that we're gonna talk about. We've, we could have incomplete loss of function or complete loss of function. And now let's talk about dominance. Okay. Now, one way in which a mutation could cause a dominant phenotype is, is, is if it causes increased function. increased activity. That would be called a hypermorph. This would be the case where there's a lot of ways in which this could happen. You could have overproduction of the gene. You could have duplication of the gene into multiple copies so that more is produced. You could have a mutation in the gene that disrupts the interaction with a negative regulator and so on. There's lots of ways this could happen. This is a common type of mutation, for instance, in cancer, where you have mutations in so-called oncogenes that are cancer-promoting, where if you have a, a type of gene that encodes a protein that promotes cell division or cell growth or cell survival, if you overactivate it, the cells can start dividing when they shouldn't be, surviving when they shouldn't be. Mutations of this type often have the opposite phenotype to a loss of function allele of that gene. Okay. 
So let's do a dosage experiment to see if we can make some predictions about what kind of data would be consistent with a hypermorph. Okay. So now we're just going to look at this dominant. So I'm just going to look at the heterozygote here. Um, and we can compare it to M1 over deficiency. While you think about what you predict is going to, which one is going to be stronger, I'll also give you another strain where we've actually increased the wild type activity. So this would be a duplication. Right, so the opposite of a deletion. In this strain, we have two copies of the wild type version of the gene. But we want to compare the phenotype strength. of these individuals. All right, any predictions? Which one will be the strongest? Yeah. OK. That's correct. So remember, the mutation is increasing activity, and increased activity is leaning to the phenotype. You're increasing activity even more here. And here, you're taking activity away. So if the phenotype is caused by more activity, the more activity you get it, the worse it gets. The less you give it, the better it gets. OK, so that's a hypermorph. However, not all dominant mutations cause increased activity. Yeah, question? Duplication by itself also be hypermorph? Yes, it may or may not cause a phenotype for a given gene. In this case, we're working with a gene where we turns out M1 is causing increased uh, activity. Um, but yes. So let's turn to um, a second class, a second way in which a dominant mutation could involve a, a, muta a dominant allele could have a mutation affecting gene activity, which is decreased activity. Okay. So not all dominants have increased activity, some dominants have decreased activity. This is called an antimorph or a dominant negative. Okay. Where <coughs> in the heterozygous state, carrying this one mutant allele antagonizes the wild type function. Dominant negatives, the phenotypes can be very similar to a loss of function allele. Or a recessive allele. Recessive loss of function alleles causing decreased function and dominant negatives <coughs> causing decreased function. Let's think about the phenotype strength. Okay, so if we have and a dominant negative, which of these would have the strongest phenotype? The phenotype is caused by decreasing function of the protein. Yeah. The one on the right. The opposite result from the hypermorph. You may wonder how in the world could a dominant negative exist? There's a lot of ways. Let me give one example. Let's say gene X encodes a protein that exists in a tetramer. So 
So when this thing functions as an enzyme or whatever it might be, four copies of the protein aggregate together like this. Now if we have a heterozygote, we might have some of these mutant versions if this protein can still fold and incorporate into the tetramer in this dominant negative allele. We might have some mutant versions incorporated in this tetramer. And if just one mutant copy in the tetramer disrupts the function of the complex, then 15 sixteenths of these complexes will be poisoned. They won't work, despite the functional copies in the tetramer. So that would be an example of a dominant negative allele. So last time we went uh, through how to interpret recessive phenotypes. What we talked about, these are uh, almost always loss of function alleles. We talked about how to distinguish between a complete loss of function or a null allele and a partial loss of function allele or a hypomorph. Then we turned to talking about dominance. We talked about um, dominance that involve increase in function, a hypermorph. And we talked about dominance that involve decrease in function, antimorphs or dominant negatives. There are a couple other ways in which a mutation could cause a dominant phenotype. Uh, so the mutation could be, uh, could the gene could be haplo-insufficient, where one copy of the gene is not enough, or the mutation could be uh, a neomorph, which creates some new function for the protein that didn't exist before. Haploinsufficiency is uh, rare in organisms. where typically one copy of a gene is enough. Okay. Now, there are some cases of haploinsufficiency, including in diseases, where often what you see is the heterozygous state displays a phenotype, so it could be the null allele would have the phenotype. A complete deletion of the, the gene could have the phenotype. Last time I used the acronym DF for deficiency to indicate a deletion of the gene. So in the case of haploinsufficiency, you see the phenotype in the heterozygote, but it's because of loss of function, and it's because one copy of that gene is not enough for a visible wild type phenotype. Often in these instances, the homozygotes are much, much stronger, and you see something weak with the heterozygotes. An example of a human disease associated with this would be diamond black fan syndrome which can be caused by heterozygosity and mutations in any of a number of genes encoding ribosomal subunits, protein subunits, and associated with anemia as well as some other disorders. Um, homozygosity for loss of ribosome subunits, as you might imagine, is, is pretty catastrophic for cell function. But heterozygosity, you can have relatively normal development, but do you do see defects. You see this anemia and other defects. If anyone has ever been over to Children's Hospital, in Boston, there's this uh, street called Black Fan Circle, which is named after this guy, Black Fan, who was uh, one of two people who named this disease. Let me give you a real example here. All right, so I'll give you a real example gene. This gene is called myostatin. And myostatin uh, mutations Mutations in the myostatin gene exist in a cattle breed called the Belgian blue cattle. Here's the Belgian blue cattle. Can anyone recognize the phenotype or propose the phenotype here? What do you see? They're very muscular. <laughs> <laughs> Lots of muscle. Okay. There are also mutations in the myostatin gene in other organisms, like, my, uh, like um, dogs. 
So here's a dog breed, the Whippet. Whippets uh, were racing dogs in the Greyhound family. So people bred these dogs for speed. So they're very fast dogs. And what they found is that um, Whippets with carrying a mutation in this gene, there were heterozygous for it, were faster. So that's what they wanted. They wanted fast dogs. But if you have heterozygotes around and you're doing crosses, you're going to end up with some homozygotes. So we get to go with the homozygotes look like. I have a picture of that. There's the homozygous myostatin mutant whippet. It's the same dog breed as this one, okay? And it just differs from the other one by being homozygous for this mutation in this gene myostatin. Okay, so they're very muscular too. Okay, so we see a little bit of a phenotype in the heterozygote, this homozygous phenotype. We want to know what the gene is normally doing. One way we could do this is, is do make a mutant allele by design, and that was done in a model system. Making what's called a knockout mouse. We'll tell you how to do this later. But this is basically where you're creating a null allele. You delete some key part of the gene. making a null allele. Okay, so now we have this null allele of the knockout mouse. Now we can see what's the story with this gene. What does it look like? Here it is. Okay, so here's the wild type mouse and here's the knockout mouse. As you can see, it's a lot bigger uh, than wild type mice. You can see from this top down picture or here you're looking at this muscles and it's very muscular. Okay, so it has huge biceps. All the muscles are huge in this, in this mice. Uh, it's the so-called uh, mighty mouse, a uh, very impressive mouse. Um, and so we can conclude then that, in this case, mutant over mutant causes increased muscle. So we can conclude something about this myostatin gene. What does the myostatin gene normally do? What do you guys think? Yeah. Uh, I think it would inhibit muscle formation. Okay, so we propose that myostatin is a negative regulator of muscle growth. All right. Now, as you'll learn about in um, lectures near the end of the course in population genetics, if you have a large enough population of individuals and enough time, mutations in genes are going to arise in a population. And they'll exist at some frequency, and we'll talk about how to figure all that out. So you could wonder, are there myostat mutations in humans? And uh, there are some. Uh, so there's a German boy who uh, is homozygous for mutations in myostatin. And at 18 months old, he supposedly could do the iron cross, some gymnastics move, and had washboard abs. Um, and his mother was a professional sprinter. And in his father's family, you look at the pedigree, there are a number of individuals known for being unusually strong. Okay, so it sort of sounds like it's got some similarities to this Whippet case. And what you see is in some uh, species, some haploinsufficiency. But in the heterozygotes, the phenotype is weakly expressive. almost invisible. If you don't look in the right assay, you might not even know there's a phenotype. But the whip, it's a little faster and so on. Okay. Now, 
let's say you wanted to uh, be inspired, inspired by this idea. So, by the way, you have myostatin around. It's floating around in your blood right now, regulating how much, you know, your muscle size and your muscle growth, muscle maintenance. So it's always active, keeping your muscles from getting larger. And you might say, well, okay, you might, could be inspired by this or other similar kind of regulators of muscle size and say, well, maybe there's some way to, to use this information to try to envision some treatments for muscle wasting disorders or diseases. Um, if you wanted to do that, what would you want to do to myostatin to try to treat muscle wasting conditions, theoretically? Yeah. Okay. And what would you predict would happen if you overactivated myostatin? Okay. So experiments like that have been done. So here's an experiment where you produce too much myostatin, experimentally, and you get cachexia, which is muscle wasting. So you make too much myostatin, you get muscle wasting. And there is a way to experimentally, uh, in model organisms, try this out by producing something that will inhibit myostatin. So let's say there's some factor X that can inhibit myostatin. What you're suggesting is you want to, to activate factor X, make more of it, something like that. Okay, there are ways to do that. Here's an example of such an experiment. This experiment was done in trout. Okay, so there's this molecule folostatin, which can inhibit myostatin. So they took trout and they made too much folostatin. And what they get is bigger, more muscular trout with this bigger fillet. Now let's think about how we interpret our function for genes, given some of this knowledge about how alleles are affecting gene function. So let's say we have some true breeding strain, some mutant, call it M1 over M1, some true breeding strain. And the phenotype in this strain is that the, this could be any kind of organism, let's say they have long legs. So that's our phenotype. We could say that M1 is an allele of a gene and define that gene. Let's say M1 is an allele of gene 1. Okay. And then what we want to know is the function of gene 1. That's, that's sort of our goal here. So any predictions or proposals for what the function of gene 1 is? Or any questions about gene 1 you'd want to, to ask before giving an answer? We have our phenotype, long legs. What we want to know is what gene 1 does. What do you think gene 1 does? Yeah. OK, so in some way, gene 1 is in some way involved in a leg growth. Does it positively regulate neg leg growth, negatively regulate leg growth? What do you think? Yeah. OK, the suggestion was we can't really tell yet. What would you want to know in order to answer that? I guess the level of expression. OK, so the suggestion was we, we can't tell, but what she, she'd want to know would be the level of expression of gene 1. You could get any of a, you know, if you'd monitor gene 1 expression, do you mean, but what do you mean by expression? Gene expression, like transcription, or, yeah. You could monitor gene 1, let's say you do that experiment, and you see gene 1 is present all through the period of leg growth. Does that help you distinguish between the possibilities? It's, it's high. Let's say. Oh, okay. You're talking about compare the levels of gene 1 in your mutant, okay. So the suggestion was compare the levels of gene 1 in your mutant strain versus the wild type. Let's say they're equal. They're equal in their wild type and the, the mutant strain. Yeah? OK. So the, the next proposal is to, to look at whether or not it's dominant. OK, so let me give you some scenarios here. Um, so scenario one, or model one, oh, sorry. Let's just call it example one. M1 is recessive. Okay. All right. 
Now can we conclude what gene one does to leg growth? Yeah? What do you think? Okay, so the proposal is a negative regulator of growth. If it's recessive, we have a loss of function allele, LOF, and I agree with the proposal. This would indicate gene one acts in some way as a negative regulator of leg growth. Okay, because when you've broken gene one, you have loss of gene one activity, you have too much leg growth. Okay, that's example one. Say example two, M1 is a hypermorph. Now what do we conclude? Yeah. Gene one is a positive regulator of leg growth. I agree. Now the hypermorph is producing too much gene one activity, and when you have too much gene one activity, the legs get longer, indicating positive regulation of leg growth. Example three. M one is an antimorph. Before we get to that, there's a question. Okay, so the question is, do, do you know if it's hypermorph or antimorph? Uh, so I'm giving you that for these examples, but how would you know? So we have a true breeding strain, and I'm sort of illustrating the importance of knowing whether it's a recessive or a hypermorph or an antimorph. How would you know? Any suggestions? Okay. You can compare it to something that is a deletion. And so th this is basically just what we went through last time. We talked about how the antimorph has the same phenotype as a loss of function allele. Often the hypermorph has the opposite phenotype. A deletion we know is a null allele. Um, so we also talked about doing dosage experiments. So that's another thing you could do to distinguish between these possibilities is dosage experiments, which dosage, there's opposite predictions for the dosage experiments with antimorph and hypermorph. So you can just look back at last time for that. But now I'll give you this result, M1 is an antimorph. So then what is our proposal for what gene one normally does? It's, we definitely are concluding gene one is in some way involved in leg growth. But if M1 turns out it's an antimorph, would we conclude that gene one is a negative or positive regulator of leg growth? We know leg growth is aberrant. Yeah. Inhibit leg growth. Similar logic to this one. Okay. So is, even though it's dominant, antimorphs are dominant, M1 is causing reduction in gene function. And when you reduce gene one function, you see longer legs. That indicates gene one normally is inhibiting leg growth, such that when you lose this, you've lost inhibition and it gets too long. Okay. All right. So it doesn't really matter what the, the phenotype is, longer legs or shorter legs. It could be either. What you have to interpret is which way it goes when you've lost the gene or increased the gene. Some genes could be negative regulators of leg growth. Some genes could be positive regulators of leg growth. Let's say... Let's say we have M2, and let's say M2, M2 has short legs, and let's say it's recessive. Okay, we could define a gene, gene 2, some way it's regulating leg growth. What is it doing to leg growth? Promoting or inhibiting? Promoting. Promoting. Yeah. Okay. 
and keep in mind, this is our goal of genetic analysis, is to learn what genes do from studying the, the mutant phenotype, manipulating the genes, manipulating the genome, and then learning something about how the normal process is being regulated by genes, or carried out by genes. We want to discover what these genes are doing, both to understand the natural process, but also for thinking about approaches, like in bioengineering, medicine, and so on. Okay. Now, you notice that when I'm giving some graphic for what the gene is doing, I'm writing the gene, not the mutation. You wouldn't write that M1 negatively regulates leg growth, because M1, after all, is just an allele of a gene, a mutation. Mutations aren't regulating some biological process. Mutations exist in a gene, and the, what we're depicting here is the normal function of the gene, not the function of a mutation. Okay? So I just wanted to emphasize that. Okay. Now, what would we do next? Really what we'd want to do is study leg growth and refine our understanding of what aspect of leg growth gene 1 or gene 2 controls. In a lot of ways, that's the heart of genetic analysis, where you have some mutant phenotype and you're trying to understand biology or some disease. And what you really want to know is what that gene does. Leg growth is a pretty crude sort of description of what this gene's doing. What exactly is it doing? And so what you could do is go in and study leg growth and try to break it down into steps that are involved in growth and ask which of those aspects of leg growth involve this gene or go awry when the gene is perturbed. Perhaps it's regulating cell proliferation of bone progenitors, or it's regulating the, some hormone, or it's, it's controlling some period of time and development in which leg growth is, is, is possible. Could be any of, of these types of things. Okay, so now we've, we've got these model systems. We've got some problems we've defined, some ways of thinking about that. We've talked a bit about how to study a process uh, by manipulating genes. And what we're going to do now in this part is we're going to try to identify genes involved in a process where we don't yet know what genes control some process of interest. We're going to try to do that by doing what's called a genetic screen. It wasn't exactly what any of you suggested earlier when we were talking about this, but the closest thing was this systematically testing every gene in the genome with CRISPR. So we're going to do a genetic screen. Many approaches to genetic screens, many approaches to finding genes involved in biology. We talked about looking at which genes turn on and then testing hypotheses and so on. This is one approach, a classic approach of genetics still widely used. And the idea here is to randomly mutate genes. Okay. So we'll randomly mutate genes. We don't know which of those 20,000 plus genes are involved in some process. We're going to let the biology tell us by randomly mutating them then hunting through all the mutants for a mutant phenotype of interest, like failed cardiomyocyte differentiation or whatever. And then we're going to say, well, that mutant must have some mutation in a gene of interest that's involved in that process. And that's how we're going to find them with this approach. Okay, does the idea make sense? Okay, all right, so we're going to do that. I'll now draw out a genetic screen for you. And we'll start this screen by mutagenizing this male. Okay. We could look for natural variants that crop up. That's what Morgan did when he found this wide-eyed fly. But we're going to greatly accelerate the process by throwing on some kind of mutagen that mutagenizes the, the animal. We're going to randomly mutate, though. So this could be uh, something like uh, radiation. 
to be a chemical mutagen. Could be an insertional mutagen. For instance, we could activate a transposon to start hopping wildly in the genome, or we could add a virus where the virus integrates in the genome. Some viruses integrate in your genome that create mutations. Okay, so we've some, done something to mutagenize this animal. Yeah. Okay, yeah, the, these will create mutations at random across the genome, and we're going to have to sift out which of those random mutations is causing our phenotype of interest. It's not targeted to a particular region of the genome or a particular gene. There are approaches like CRISPR and others where you can target a mutagenesis process to a specific gene, but these are random. Now, which mutagen you choose will create different classes of mutations, depending on if it's a base modifier or something that creates double-stranded breaks and so on. Yeah. And you learn a bit about that in the, in the mutation topic. Um, okay. All right. So let's say I'm going to give you a hypothetical mutation that we've introduced in this process. I'll call it M1. And we have, um, uh, let's say, a, a, a hypothetical, this hypothetical mutation is breaking our process of interest, so we think that this is uh, of interest. Um, I'm just going to give that to you. If we're looking for dominant phenotypes, we are done with our screen at this point. So at this stage, we could look for dominance. It's a very easy screen. It's hard to get a lot easier than this. We just mutate, look for phenotypes in the next generation. Dominants are rare, however. Uh, but if you break a gene to a loss of function state, such a mutation is typically recessive. So often in screens, you're looking for recessive phenotypes. All right. So let's go forward to try to find a recessive phenotype. Any suggestions on what we could do next in our screen design here to find recessive phenotypes? Yeah. Okay. The suggestion was to cross two F1s to one another. Okay. And I'm going to suggest uh, that that will not work. That if we do this, we won't find mutants from doing that. Why wouldn't we? Well, let's think about what exactly we're, we're doing here. Um, so what we're doing is we're mutagenizing this original male, and the cells that are going to matter are the cells of the uh, so-called germline. Any mutation in the soma of that male is not going to be passed on, only mutations in the germline. The germline are the cells that go on to make the gametes, like the sperm and, or the eggs, in this case the sperm. And we've mutated these germ cells randomly. So the gametes that arise are going to have random mutations. So this one might happen to have this hypothetical M1. This one might have some other mutation, M2. Maybe this one had no mutations for some reason. Maybe this one had two mutations, M3 and M4. The reality is there will be a lot of mutations, and they'll be different, a different collection of mutations in each individual sperm. So do you see, if you want to carry forward with that, do you see why now the crossing the F1 to F1 would, would not work? OK. Um, so if we use, if we, so just to give you a sense of numbers here, if you wanted to introduce um, a high level of mutations to, to do this efficiently, what kind of rate of mutations in a given gene would you expect? Well, um, it just depends on the, the mutagen and the dose, but uh, for a given gene, there's about, about a 1 in 2,000 chance
of having a mutation. to loss of function. In many cases, in many organisms, that's about the, the dose of mutagen that's being used is to cause this kind of level of mutagenesis. So for our given uh, F1, it may have had M1, but our F1 number two may have had some other mutation. And when we cross them, we fail to see homozygosity. For this to work, we'd have to have both F1s carry mutations in the same gene. And if the odds of one of them having this mutation is one in 2,000, the odds of both having it would be one in 2,000 squared. Okay. So that's why this is not gonna work. So we have to do something else. Though it is possible to screen for recessives. So uh, any suggestions of what we could do? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so exactly. So the suggestion was to breed this F1 with a wild type. This will give us siblings, F2 siblings, okay, where one half of them will carry this mutation, one half don't. And then the suggestion was to try to breed these siblings together because now we have lots of individuals that will carry whatever mutation was in there. What we really want here is we want to cross uh, F2 siblings by another F2 sibling where they both happen to be M1 over plus. And if we get that, then one quarter of the offspring will be homozygous. And that's where we can look for our recessives in this F3 generation. Every F1 will have a different genotype. So F1 number one, we're going to do this process I've just drawn here in F1 number one. And we'll do a similar process in F1 number two. Okay, where we'll cross to wild type and cross F2 sibs. We'll do a sim similar thing with F1 number three, and so on. Each F1, we have to generate offspring that carry whatever mutations it has. What percentage of our crosses will be of this type? Yeah. One fourth. One fourth of our crosses will be like this. We don't know which crop, which F twos are going to have this genotype. We can't see it, it's a recessive phenotype. It's what we're looking for. And so we might wanna set up a lot of crosses to have good chances of having at least one cross be of this type. We only have a one quarter chance for if we take any two, F, uh, two siblings to do this. So we could sort of say, uh, let's say we want a 95% chance of having at least one cross of this type. Okay, so if we want to have a 95% chance of setting up at least one cross of this type, there's a three-quarter chance for any cross that we get it wrong. So this would one, be one minus the probability of getting no crosses of the right type, which is one minus three-quarters to the n. Okay, and if we wanted a 95% chance of getting at least one right, n would be about 10 crosses. Okay, so if you think about what we're doing here, we get one F1, we generate siblings in the F2, and then we set up a lot of these F2 sib cross, sibling crosses, like 10 of them, and then we look in this F3 for mutant phenotypes in each of those crosses. Now what have we accomplished by doing that with one given F1? Okay, so a given F1 you know, or F1 number one, it has one mutagenized genome. Okay? Each organism has two genomes, one from the mother, one from the father. One copy of the genome was mutagenized here. And what we're saying is, and we're, for a given gene, we're, we're going to have about a 1 in 2,000 chance of being loss of function. So in our process here, in our screen, we screened about 0.95 mutagenized genomes by doing this. If 
if we set up these 10 crosses. And so what we'd have to do is we'd do this process for F1 number one. Now we've screened 0.95 mutagenized genomes. We do this pro same process for F2 number two, the same process for F3, F1 number three, and so on. And for each one, each F1, we're gonna, for a given gene, we're going to have about a 1 in 2,000 chance that it will be mutated. Of course, there's 20,000 genes in the genome. There may be multiple genes involved in our process. But because of this, we're going to have to do this hundreds of times, if not thousands of times, to screen hundreds to thousands of mutagenized genomes. Okay. Um, there are a host of approaches to make this easier. If you were thinking about a fish, you might have three months here, three months here, maybe lots of tanks where you're setting up crosses, and then another three months. Okay, so that's a lot of time and effort, and then you're going to do that, that process I just described hundreds to thousands of times, maybe in parallel. Well, you're going to see how with some organisms you could do that same process in a week uh, in, the, in the next lecture. And there's, so there's a variety of approaches to take to make these, these screens more efficient. Last time what we were talking about is uh, genetic screens and more generally how to use the tools of genetics to try to under, uncover the mechanistic basis for topics and problems in biology, topics of biology. Okay, where genetic screens is one approach to this, but there are a lot of approaches. So you can go with uh, sort of custom gene by gene hypothesis driven approaches where you can edit the genome by design and we'll get into a lot of that, but where we're beginning with looking for mutants and trying to use mutants to understand biology is with these screens. A variation on a screen is a selection in which, a procedure in which only individuals of a, with a specific phenotype might survive. The general idea here is that we are randomly introducing mutations into individuals in a laboratory setting and then seeking those mutations that will disrupt some process of interest. If we do not know the genes that are important for some process, this is one way of trying to find them. We can just look for mutants where the process goes awry and then reason that what has been mutated in that mutant strain must be some gene that's important for that process. And in that way, we can discover those genes. Okay. This is the, uh, the screen we went through in the last lecture. Briefly to recap. What we did was mutagenize an individual and then cross to a wild type to introduce mutations. Keep in mind what we're doing when we mutagenize this individual is randomly in introducing mutations through cells throughout the body. Some of the cells are, that are mutated are the cells that produce gametes. Every cell will receive random mutations so that every gamete will have different mutations. Therefore, the, the genotype with the specific mutations inherited in the F1 individuals will be different individual to individual. Each F1 will have a different set of mutations that was introduced by this random mutagenesis process. So for each F1 then, we could seek the, or ask the question whether that F1 individual carries a mutation of some kind that would cause a defect in our process of interest. If we were looking for mutations that would cause a recessive phenotype, we had to look at individuals that became homozygous for any given theoretical mutation that an F1 might have. Because each F1 is unique, we then had to generate more animals that carried any given mutation by crossing to wild type to generate siblings in the F2, where half of the siblings would carry whatever mutagenized chromosome uh, might carry a theoretical mutation. We could then cross these siblings, F2 sibling crosses, uh, where one quarter of the crosses would be of this desired type, and then one quarter of the offspring from this type of cross in the F3 would be homozygous for our mutation. So that was what we went through last time. Any questions about that before I transition to different screens? The screen, the variant screens I'm going to give you now endeavor to make this process a little bit more efficient or easier. Some of the challenges here the fact that we have to go through all of these generations, an extra generation to generate siblings, to make a mu given mutation homozygous. Each of these steps could take a long period of time. We have to go through large numbers of F1s. We don't know which uh, chromosome, uh, which of these individuals might carry the mutagenized chromosome, and so on. 
Okay, so we're going to try to deal with some of those, those challenges in the next uh, three example screens. But before I do that, I'll just pause here for any questions. Yeah? The question was, why is this one quarter of the crosses? So if you cross m1 over plus to plus over plus, half of the progeny will be m1 over plus. So if we randomly take two individuals out of here, there's a one-half chance that individual one is m1 over plus and a one-half chance m1. Individual two is m1 over plus. So that's one quarter probability. Last time, what we were talking about is uh, genetic screens and more generally, how to use the tools of genetics to try to under uncover the mechanistic basis for topics and problems in biology, topics of biology. Okay, where genetic screens is one approach to this, but there are a lot of approaches. So you can go with uh, sort of custom gene by gene hypothesis driven approaches where you can edit the genome by design, and we'll get into a lot of that. But where we're beginning with looking for mutants and trying to use mutants to understand biology is with these screens. A variation on a screen is a selection in which a procedure in which only individuals of a, with a specific phenotype might survive. The general idea here is that we are randomly introducing mutations into individuals in a laboratory setting, and then seeking those mutations that will disrupt some process of interest. If we do not know the genes that are important for some process, this is one way of trying to find them. We can just look for mutants where the process goes awry, and then reason that what has been mutated in that mutant strain must be some gene that's important for that process. And in that way, we can discover those genes. Okay. This is the, uh, the screen we went through in the last lecture. Briefly to recap, what we did was mutagenize an individual and then cross to a wild type to introduce mutations. Keep in mind what we're doing when we mutagenize this individual is randomly in, mu introducing mutations through cells throughout the body. Some of the cells are, that are mutated are the cells that produce gametes. Every cell will receive random mutations so that every gamete will have different mutations. Therefore, the, the genotype with re, uh, the specific mutations inherited in the F1 individuals will be different individual to individual. Each F1 will have a different set of mutations that was introduced by this random mutagenesis process. So for each F1, then, we could seek the, or ask the question whether that F1 individual carries a mutation of some kind that would cause a defect in our process of interest. If we were looking for mutations that would cause a recessive phenotype, we had to look at individuals that became homozygous for any given theoretical mutation that an F1 might have. Because each F1 is unique, we then had to generate more animals that carried any given mutation by crossing to wild type to generate siblings in the F2, where half of the siblings would carry whatever mutagenized chromosome uh, might carry a theoretical mutation. We could then cross these siblings, F2 sibling crosses, uh, where one quarter of the crosses would be of this desired type, and then one quarter of the offspring from this type of cross in the F3 would be homozygous for our mutation. So that was what we went through last time. Any questions about that before I transition to different screens? The, screen, the variant screens I'm going to give you now endeavor to make this process a little bit more efficient or easier. Some of the challenges here, the fact that we have to go through all of these generations, an extra generation to generate siblings, to make a mut given mutation homozygous. Each of these steps could take a long period of time. We have to go through large numbers of F1s. We don't know which uh, chromosome uh, which of these individuals might carry the mutagenized chromosome, and so on. Okay, so we're going to try to deal with some of those, those challenges in the next uh, three example screens. But before I do that, I'll just pause here for any questions. Yeah? The question was, why is this one quarter of the crosses? So if you cross M1 over plus to plus over plus, half of the progeny will be M1 over plus. So if we randomly take two individuals out of here, there's a one-half chance that individual one is M1 over plus and a one-half chance M1. Individual two is M1 over plus. So that's one quarter probability. All right, so let's move to screen B. So I've called that screen A, screen B. So 
So in screen B, we will look for X-linked mutations. Okay. Any ideas about why it might be easier to look for mutations causing recessive phenotype on the X chromosome? Yeah. Uh, because of males are hemizygous. Okay. Um, if that's a male type of mutation, it'll show up immediately. Okay, great. So the, the idea is that males have only one X chromosome. So uh, you might see that without having to go through all these generations. So what would the screen be? Any proposals for a screen for X-linked mutations? What, uh, what individual would you want to uh, mutagenize, let's say a, a male or a female? Yeah. OK. So the proposal is to mutagenize a female. We'll cross to a male. Now in the F1, if we've, in a given male, it has inherited a given mutation, theoretical mutation of interest, you can see the recessive phenotype in that first generation. So that's a much easier screen. Of course, you're only looking at the X chromosome. So you can get recessive phenotypes in this way. Question? Okay. So the question was: so when you mutagenize the female, how do you how are you do you know that you're mutagenizing the X chromosome? The mutations will be random across all chromosomes. And so if a given F1 had a mutation in some gene of interest on chromosome two. It would be like this. It would be, some, it would be heterozygous for it, and you, you're not going to see it in the screen. You're only going to see phenotypes in this F1 if the phenotype is uh, caused by the mutation is dominant, or if it's in males and it's recessive. Yeah. OK. Now, listen, this, this is a great screen. Um, but imagine the, uh, the process of interest is something essential for viability. We were talking about some examples last time, like cardiomyocyte development. Um, so let's say what we're interested in is heart development, and the individuals are not going to, uh, with the phenotype of interest, are not going to live long enough to reproduce. And yet we want to know what genes are involved in the process. We want to map them and work with them, study the phenotype to understand cardiac development and that gene's role. So that's, that's one limitation of this type of screen. If it's an essential process, this male then would not be able to reproduce. You found your dream mutant, uh, but it's then gone. So there are variants on the screen. If you're looking for essential genes, genes essential for viability, I'll let you think about it on your own to see if you can come up with a variant screen where you can go one other generation, uh, set it up in a slightly different way to try to get use this trick of the males, but also have siblings that would carry the mutation as well, females, that would allow you to propagate more individuals carrying that mutation. So I'll let you think about that on your own. I'm happy to answer questions about that if you like as well. <laughs>